hello, hello, and welcome in to everyone. Um, so today we're going to be going over three point perspective. So hello to everyone who has popped in a little early to come and say hi. Um, yeah, so if you have never been to one of these streams before, not only are we... Um, Oh, sorry. If you've never been to these streams before, let me talk a bit about us. Um, if you didn't know, our growing community is filled with tons of art nerds, and we art nerds have to stick together. So if you're an art nerd too, if you're an art nerd too, be sure to check out the links to our social media in the description below, and check out our website uh, for our class offerings. Because we're not just a YouTube channel; we're an art school too. So if you'd like to support us, so we can keep making free content, consider supporting us on Patreon, where you can get access to tons of perks like my working files, critique sessions, and a huge discount on our classes that have a limited amount of spots so be sure to check those out before they are gone uh, right and just like last week we are going to be you know working in perspective and talking a bit about you know probably the most difficult form of perspective which is three point um well, it's the most difficult if you don't go anything beyond three point right one point and two point are fairly easy compared to three point perspective um which is saying a lot <laughs> uh, because three point, you know, like we mentioned last time, two point perspective is, you know, two points. One point perspective is one point. So one vanishing point, right? But three point perspective is three different points, three different vanishing points instead of just the one or two. Also, apologies in advance if I'm hello, Alyssa. Um, Apologies in advance if I'm a little bit, like, woozy. <laughs> um, our studio just finished our March break camp, and it was a lot of fun, but I did teach two classes before this one. So, <laughs> just, if I'm a little bit kind of all over the place today, that's why. So, just like with the other two perspectives, I'm going to start with my shapes. Let me actually just open up the files from the past two weeks. Let me just find them real quick. should be here somewhere. I have a lot of files, guys. <laughs> Maybe too many. I have too many files. I can't open two at once. That's fine. Right, so this was one point perspective where I explained what perspective was just in general. And I also talked a bit about all the different shapes that you could draw in one point perspective. And I explained this kind of method down here, which was, you know, the different axes. So, um, that you would work with when you're drawing, right? So for one point, you would choose one axis to recede towards your vanishing point, right? And more likely than not, it would be your z-axis that would be receding back towards it, right? When I say recede, right, everything kind of gets smaller as it goes back towards your vanishing point, right? So everything kind of gets a little bit smaller. And for two-point perspective, right, instead of just one vanishing point, now there are two. Right, and I mentioned this, oh, I'm sorry, I hit my my keyboard, whoopsies. Um, instead of, you know, it being, you know, just one axis, right, two point is choosing two axes to recede towards a vanishing point, right? And it'll most likely be axis X and Z, right? So these two, and Y would be completely vertical, right? But compared to last time, there are different axes, Different sorry, two different vanishing points um, that correspond to the two axes, depending on how you like to think of your own perspective. And of course, um, all previous perspective streams are available for replay. Um, they're still on our channel if you would like to check them out. Um, so if you don't know too, too much about perspective, feel free to check those ones out too. Um, and just like the last streams, we'll talk a bit about drawing shapes in perspective, and then we'll actually get to drawing a background. I don't remember what won the poll. <laughs> um, for our live stream last time. So let me check that real quick because I don't remember. Oh, it was a waterfall. Okay. Then I'll be drawing a waterfall for this week then. Wonderful. All right. So let's get back to three-point perspective then. So since we talked about our axes last time, right? If this was, oh, what did I draw? This was our z-axis. 
right, all these angles. This is our x-axis. This is our y-axis. Right, so when I say the axes, right, y, x, y and x are the ones that you're most likely more familiar with, right, because those are the two that um, are on most graphs. But then this one, the z-axis, is the three-dimensional plane. That's why they call it 3D. Y is one dimension. Y or X is one dimension, right? Y and X is two dimensions, plus Z is three dimensions. Three-dimensionality. That's why these shapes are 3D, right? And that's why we talk about it. So with three-point perspective... Right, so with a one point perspective, you can choose one axis to recede. Two point, you choose two axes to recede. With three axes, three point perspective, we choose all three. All three axes recede towards a VP or a vanishing point. Right, so this time, all three axes will recede towards a vanishing point. So not only will just Y, X, or Z recede towards a vanishing point, all three of them will be. Right, So we're going to have three different points where our axes will go back towards. Let me just change the size of this a little bit. Make this a little bit smaller so I can fit a square somewhere. So like before, the easiest thing to draw in perspective is a cube. So let's start with cubes. So this is going to be text here, cubes. Switch this to the square tool. And let's create our first square. I'm actually going to put this into a folder. I'm going to organize this a little bit better. Oops, just so it's a little bit easier to turn off layers and stuff. I usually hate using this much layers, but I'm going to this time. So this is my vanishing point and horizon line. So like before, I'm going to have, even though technically you don't want your horizon line or anything directly in the center, this time I am going to put them there because I think that it just makes it a little bit easier. Well, not directly in the center, I think I'm going to put a little bit lower because it's a little bit easier to see them when I do this. So I'm going to go one, two, but I'm also, I'm going to put, actually put this pretty far down, one, two, and three. So I'm going to choose one, two, and three points. Your third vanishing point, when it comes to three point perspective, will always either be above or below your horizon line. So either above or below your horizon line. Hello, Wolf Luna. It'll always be above or below your horizon line and always between your first two vanishing points. So let me write that down. Welcome to the stream. If you haven't, we haven't really done much. We're starting with cubes just like last time. So your third vanishing point. always above or below horizon line. I hope I spelled that right. <laughs> My brain's kind of all over the place. So your third vanishing point will always be above or below your horizon line. We'll also Always be between between the two VPs on horizon line. This rule can be broken, but that's with more like 
intense <laughs> kind of artwork. That one's a little bit more advanced, so we're not going to get into that. I'm trying to keep it as not advanced as possible. <laughs> get? Okay, I'm listening and drawing my best drawing at the same time. Excellent. Fantastic. So your third vanishing point will always be above or below the horizon line and will also always be between the two vanishing points on the horizon line. When the vanishing point is above, it makes things look big. When the vanishing point is below, it makes things look small. Right, so when we have different angles, right, we're looking at different angles. That's what three-point perspective is, is it suddenly adds in looking at things at different angles and looking at things you know, in uh, with with size in mind, right? So now we're thinking, do we want to make things look big or do we want to make things look small, all right? So we got to, you know, think about how we want our objects to look. So again, let's go back to drawing our cubes. I'm going to do two different types of cubes, all right? So I'm going to do one cube that is above the vanishing point. And what I'm, I'm going to do one that, oh, you know what? I'm going to do one that looks big. I'm going to do one that looks small. So I'm only going to do two shapes this time around. So I'm only going to do cubes and I'm going to do cylinders. But I'm going to show you guys how it looks bigger and looks smaller. Because that's really the key to drawing three points. Okay. So like what we did last time. Oops. Like what we did last time. Hello, M. Welcome in. Hi. So like what we did last time, what we are going to do is we are going to draw in, you know, the base of our cube first, I, or of our rectangular prism. So let's draw these two lines that are meeting over here to create our base. It's going to be kind of flat this time because it's very, very low down. I've been okay. How have you been? It's just been kind of busy this week. <laughs> Technically, I guess this stream is my third class of the day <laughs> because of um, spring break, but I hope you've been well. All right, so we have our base square down here. And instead of just drawing upwards, now what we're going to do is take all of our corners and bring it back towards our third vanishing point. So almost like how we would draw our um, pyramids. And now what we can do is take our two vanishing points on the ground and bring those back upwards. So now what we got, I mean, now I can lower this opacity. So now what we got is a cube or a rectangular prism in three point perspective. Right? So now you can see that absolutely nothing is parallel anymore. Right? Everything is, you know, going towards something. Right? It's receding towards something. Right? But you notice how kind of askew it is, right? How it's kind of like, it feels a little bit warped. And that's what we're going to talk about later as well. So let me draw in another cube. Right? This is usually how you do like cityscapes and buildings. So if I start my, my cube from down here this time and bring the edges back this way instead, Again, for those who kind of popped in a little bit later, apologies if I'm a little bit all over the place. I am a little bit loopy. So <laughs> I just want to... A little bit loopy due to spring break camp, but...
you know, still trucking along. And if I did one more kind of over here, I'm going to follow along with this bottom line over here. Right, bring it back up towards my third vanishing point. And fill in the rest of the edges as well. But you do notice how askew it looks. It looks pretty warped, right? If I turn it off, it really looks like they're lean back pretty far. <laughs> um, but this would be how you would make something look really tall, right? Because it's like, if a person is down here, right? This looks like a really huge building, right? This is how you make objects feel very, very tall. All right, so let's call this low angle. low angle cubes. For a high angle, now I'm going to do it the opposite. I always like fall short whenever I <laughs> whenever I make my canvases, right? They're always just too small. This is a 4000 by uh, 10,000 pixel canvas by the way. If you're wondering how big these are. I may just have to let me adjust the size again. I may just have to do this. There we go. But I may also, why did I close that? I needed to make it taller too. <laughs> Let's make this that tall. Yeah. So now I can make it a little bit taller instead of just super, super wide. Okay. So now let's make it some high angle cubes. All right, so this time my horizon line's all the way up here. Turn up this opacity once again. And now my third vanishing point is all the way at the bottom here. Now I'm drawing them as plus signs. I'm drawing my last one as a plus sign because it creates a crosshair kind of similar to here. Makes it a little bit easier to find my center. Right, so let's create my square. Right, let's actually make that a little bit taller up here. Of course, I could also do it so it's above the horizon line, but I didn't give myself enough room, so so be it. And of course, just like before, we're going to bring down every single corner. Coming back. Hello, just joined. Hello, Elsa. Welcome in. We're doing the three-point perspective, so we're getting a little far more tricky <laughs> this time around. We're starting off with our squares, with our cubes, right, and prisms. My hello, welcome in. All right. But once again, we got our our edges, right? Sorry, I just have to check something real quick. All right, so when we have this kind of, um, wow, <laughs> this kind of pyramid shape, now we can draw in the other edges of my cube when it's upwards from a high angle this time. If I connect my sides,
Now we can see a cube from above. And just like before, right, just like before, no lines are going to be parallel this time, right? Because it's a three point, three point perspective. So all axes are going to be receding towards a vanishing point. So nothing is going to be perfectly, you know, aligned with each other. So again, let's create another cube that's kind of over here this time. Bring the vanishing points back. Oh, here's a good point to talk about tangents. Let me just create this cube real quick. All right, so we kind of got our edges here. And now we can create this next cube. Hello, Nana Ever Rose, and you're finally getting your first drawing tablet. That's excellent. My very first drawing tablet was older than me, <laughs> and I had no pen pressure. So fantastic. I'm glad that you're getting a new pen tablet. Here's a, here's a fantastic time to talk about tangents. So what's happening here is actually a tangent. You notice how, like, um, how this side, because it's so close, it becomes one straight edge. That becomes a tangent, right? Say if I drew a tree, right, and there's a car that's supposed to be behind it. So if the edge of the car is touching the side of that tree, this is a beautiful car, by the way, but if the edge of that car is touching that tree, this is a tangent because it aligns too perfectly. We never want that. We never want anything to align too, too perfectly. So the way that you'd fix that is if you have the tree completely overlapping the car or you'd have the car not touching the tree at all. Right? So for the sake of time, I'm not going to fix that because I know that it's a tangent here, but I don't want to spend too long on that. And then I'll do one more cube over here too. Which I think that's gonna end up being a tangent too. Maybe? Oh, no it's not. It's just gonna be very, very skewed. And we got one more cube right here. Right, we always wanna bring our sides back. Always, always, always. Right? But again, these cubes look very, very kind of intense. Right? <laughs> They're a little bit strange. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to cut it off at the cubes because if you've seen how you do it in cubes, you've seen how you do it with cylinders. Because cylinders are just like you add a circle in it instead. These are high angle cubes. Because it takes a while to actually draw something in three-point perspective. The only difference between anything is like, you know, The only difference between most shapes is like, you know, whether it's like rounded or not. Rounded shapes are very, very hard to do in perspective regardless. Um, so I'm not really going to go over those because they can get kind of tricky. Um, you know what? I'm going to do one, one more. One more. I'll do... Oops. That's not big enough. I'll do a pyramid in perspective. This one I'm going to do from a low angle and ab and above the horizon line. Because we got a little bit of time before we heat reach half an hour. Because I always want to spend at least a good like hour and a half on the background because it's going to take a while. So let's put my vanishing point or horizon line really, really low on the ground again. Oh, still on that tool. Oopsies. And my vanishing point nice and high up here. So let's say I wanted to do, you know, a pyramid. What that would entail 
would be me drawing in my square first. This time it's going to be above ground, above the horizon line. Finding each corner, crossing them over, right? So it creates an X in the center. And then from that middle of the X, that's the point I'm going to take and bring back to the horizon, the horizon line. And the rest of the edges, I can connect. So that's how I do a pyramid. Let me do one more before I get to kind of cleaning that up. If I create a pyramid, right, the base of one, which is a square, kind of a square thing, find the corners of each edge, connect them so it creates an X, and then in the middle of that X, I'm going to take it and bring that back to the vanishing point. And then take all of my corners that will actually show up and connect those to wherever I want my tip of the point to be. So now we got our pyramids. They're a little bit askew. So let me actually talk about that a little bit. I'm just going to move stuff around like I usually do just to make sure that it kind of fits all together. All right. Now I can also kind of change the height of this as well. Is this one going to be a square? No, I can be a little bit smaller than that. Okay. But the thing with this is it all looks a little bit, you know, wonky, right? All the shapes look a little bit distorted, right? Why is my my R my shapes distorted? Most of the time. These are not on the canvas. Usually are far off the canvas. Right? So I was kind of putting them on the canvas to show you how these things work. But 90% of the time when we have our vanishing points, just so they're not super, super skewed, we want them to be very, very far off the canvas. All right? So if we have like, let me actually move this down here. So let's say if I had like, you know, my one point here, horizon line, two vanishing points, usually the points where there wouldn't be very much distortion would be kind of just around here. 
right? It's a very, very small area which won't have a lot of distortion, right? Which is why usually we want to make that small area the entire canvas. So we have to pull our perspective points very, very far away from that very small area. The closer you get, to the boundaries, the closer you get to the boundaries, the more extreme the perspective gets. So you can have some really intense perspective, right? You can have some really, really extreme. I'm going to move this over. You can have some very, very extreme looking perspective, right? Really, really intense looking. But That's kind of advanced, and if you go just a little bit over the edge, then it can end up looking a lot more messy than it does extreme. Right? So you have to be careful when it comes to that. So let me just save this one, because I think I'm pretty much done with all the theory bits, so we can stop kind of just watching me write half the time. Alright, this is stream 11. Been 11 of these so far? We've been doing this for 11 weeks. Pretty intense. Oh, probably more weeks, but. Oh, all right. So, I I'm, again, I'm pretty sure that what won the stream last time, what won the poll for what background I was going to do, I think what won the poll was a waterfall. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Let me just check once again. Yes, so waterfall is what one for drawing in perspective. Right, so that's what I will be doing in three point perspective is drawing a waterfall on a mountain. Right? So let me show you, let me make this whole canvas and let me show you just how extreme I'm going to have to make this this canvas size, right? And how extreme I'm going to have to make this little border. So this is going to be my bounding box. This is going to be my actual canvas. A waterfall one. Okay, excellent. So this is going to be my actual canvas over here. So I'm going to make it look very, very tall. So my vanishing point, my final one, is going to be all the way up here, right? Completely off of my initial canvas. My two horizon line points are going to be kind of over here. I'm actually going to do, let me think for a second, if I have it. Yeah, so I'm actually going to do it kind of here-ish. see how large this is here. That's actually pretty good. Okay, cool. Just joins no clue how this three-point perspective works, but I gotta figure out why watching, I guess. Yeah, it is a little bit tricky. Three-point perspective is kind of a little bit tricky, but the rundown is it's just adding another point compared to, you know, just adding two points or three points. So with the axes explanation, instead of it just being X or Z, or choosing one of them, or X and Z, we're having all three of these axes receding back to a vanishing point. So it's always one above or one below. It'll always also be 
between the two vanishing points on the horizon line and stuff like that. But welcome in, Arnoise Barn Owl. I love barn owls. So cute. But yes, I'm going to have my... My canvas will always be the layer above. This is going to be my sketch. I'm actually going to have to use a lot of layers for this one. So this is going to be my sketch folder. So my vanishing points are going to be all the way down here. Me drawing on them. Let's make them red. Because usually... Uh, actually... Yeah, let's make them... Yeah. So let's make them red. Watch the last live stream. I hope it'll make it easier to understand. Yep, it's just adding a third point. If you're kind of the if you're kind of here before with the last two, it gets a little bit easier. Hey, barn owls are my favorite animal. Yeah, they're super cute. My favorite animal is the fennec fox. I think I'm gonna have my horizon line be kind of right here. So I'm going to have my horizon line be kind of a little bit below. Actually, you know, I'm going to make it even lower. Let's do that. Yeah. So I'm going to have it below the center. I'm going to have one of my vanishing points all the way over here. So let's draw that line again, actually. So one vanishing point is going to be... Oh, good gracious. Okay, there we go. One vanishing point is going to be all the way over here. The other one's going to be a little bit closer over here. And my third point is going to be all the way up here. Fennecs are super cute too. Yeah, I love them. My third point is going to be all the way up here. Right? So I want that va final vanishing point really, really far off my canvas. So I want it completely out of there. So that's where my vanishing points are. So now I can actually start to sketch in. For those of you who don't know, um, I have D, which stands for diagram. Um, having my own shorthand, which kind of helps me. It's not, it's not great if you're looking at my <laughs> my workspace, though. I love foxes, especially ones with big ears. Yeah, Fennecs are, have one of the largest ears of the entire fox species. Look them up. They're great. That's the fennec fox. F-E-N-N-E-C. Fox. They're fantastic. I love those things. You love fennec. Huge ears. Yeah. Super, super cute. So like I mentioned, a waterfall one for the pole. I'm going to move this up, actually. So I'm kind of going to start with... You know, just the very basic shapes when it comes to, you know, maybe drawing this waterfall, right? So I'm going to start with drawing a... Huh? Oh, I raised it, so now the vanishing point is gone. Whoopsies. <laughs> okay, so maybe I do just have to keep it there then. Oh, well, that's fine. Ooh, what I could do is just... Haha, -ha, the joys! Joys of digital art. Big brain. <laughs> oh yes, and welcome Kathy and Lennox. Welcome in. <laughs> it was me who mentioned the Phoenix. The Phoenix Fox. The Phoenix Fox. Okay. So let me start by drawing in my rectangular prism, right? Which will end up being my waterfall. Or part of it. I forgot to say hello. Well, that's fine. Glad you're in. Welcome in. And now I can bring these corners all the way back up to my vanishing point up here. Right? This is still going to be some pretty extreme perspective. Let's 
just because it is still quite skewed. But what's good is I have my kind of basic shape in here. But that's kind of what matters. Can add in some extra shapes as well. It's maybe there's like a really big tree here too. Maybe this is like a it's like a forest. Well, I, I'm assuming it's a forest. I don't know where else you'd find a waterfall. <laughs> Other than like the wilderness or like a man-made one at a mall or something. Alright, so I'm kind of drawing it out as if it's a Minecraft tree right now. Just bringing back up my vanishing points. So I've kind of got a tree somewhat blocking out. Somehow blocking out the tree a little bit. Really block out where the waterfall bit's going to go as well. Alright, so it's going to kind of stop here. I'm going to have another mountain bit here as well. Right, you notice that it's already starting to get kind of intense <laughs> with all of my lines, right? Like I mentioned with last stream, right? You kind of have to get used to, you know, drawing a lot, a lot of lines with perspective. Because there's going to be a lot of... um a lot of perspective lines everywhere and you're going to kind of have to get used to it. You kind of train your eyes over time as well. Just know where you're going. It's all about that object permeance. <laughs> yeah, so that one's there. So let's make it about that tall. So this is just me kind of blocking out all of my shapes. All right, the very, very rough shapes of what's happening. And this will perhaps be like a little bit of water over here. Perspective backgrounds in art class have always been my weakness. It's not like I didn't understand it. It's just everything had to be lined up and match all the perspective lines. Yeah. And it's especially tricky when you're doing something organic and you have to line it up with perspective because there's that kind of fine line between it looking natural and that fine line and like it looking like not great <laughs> right it's a little bit tricky on that end too so good on you and at any point if you ever find that it starts to get a little bit too confusing just create a new layer and use a new, a new color so i'm going to switch to pink now because I want to add some rocks in the water here. So again, actually I'm going to make that a little bit less in your face there. And to those who are just popping in once again, um, I apologize if I'm a little bit woozy, just because our spring break camp for Wing Canvas just finished. If you didn't know, we're also in art school. Link in the description. So check out the classes we are, we have. We also have camps, which one of them we just finished. We also have summer camp, which registration, I believe, has just opened. So if you ever wanted to have summer camp with me, now's your chance. <laughs> you fail it every time. It's tricky. You kind of got to get used to it. It took me a few years to actually enjoy perspective, because now I love doing perspective. Only digitally, though. I can't stand perspective traditionally. <laughs> Because then I have to bust out a ruler, and I'm like, I don't want to. I don't want to touch a ruler, man. There always be lots of lines. Yep, you kind of got to get used to the lines. The messiness of perspective will always be there until you can kind of do it without looking. I think I did this a little bit too close here.
Yeah, as always as well, if you have any questions, if you want to ask me anything, feel free to do so. Even if I'm kind of just chatting, I'll respond when I can. Yeah, I'm kind of using all these extra lines, kind of getting the feel for what I'm doing. <laughs> Hello, Faye. Um, lovely Faye, our um, studio director. There she is. Um, to be honest, I don't know anymore what line and shape is what. Still trying to figure it out. Yeah. I still know where everything is, right? It's like I've kind of gotten used to where I kind of know where everything is already. Yes, you have to fail to succeed. I used to be terrible at perspective. I'm still not great at it, but I do my best. <laughs> I just enjoy perspective a lot, I think. No, I shouldn't line it up. I think I should just like, yeah. Okay. So now what I can do, now that it just looks like a mess of crosses, <laughs> even though I know where everything is, it looks kind of like a mess right now. So now what I can do, I, oh, so many lines, yeah. So it looks like a little, kind of like a mess of crosses right now, but I promise I know where everything is. Um, so now it's time to actually block out the first proper sketch pass. Now what I'm going to do is actually start to, you know, make stuff show up, right? Instead of it just being there, right? So here's where I blocked out. I can still see it. This section here is where I blocked out my first pass of rocks. So let's go back to that. Of course, I'm just kind of blocking it out so I know where to go. I can continue from there. Right, but this is my first pass of the mountain. Here's the other side of it. So now I can block that out too. It's all about following your perspective. I'm afraid to ask, but what's the big square for? Um, the big square, we're drawing a waterfall. So I kind of have this first huge rectangle as my waterfall. Um, this one over here is a tree. There's another tree over here that I've blocked out as well. And there's a few cubes down here for extra rocks. Right, so it's just me filling in the space as of right now. Right, so this is my waterfall that I've kind of blocked out down here. This right here is my giant tree trunk. So when you're drawing organic things in perspective, I think it's where the picture is going to be. Oh, yes. Oh, you meant like the frame. Yeah, so we talked about it earlier. But usually when we do anything in perspective, any backgrounds in perspective, our actual perspective points, our vanishing points, are far, far off the canvas. Like way, way gone. Um, but the rectangle that we have, like our actual canvas, is like, um, usually we want to put it where, like, you know, um, there won't be much distortion. Um, this is kind of an extreme perspective. But usually we want to put our perspective lines at a point where it won't get distorted because from our last page, you notice how everything was kind of close together. So all the shapes looked really, really distorted. Like when your field of view in a, in a video game is really, really close in, right? So we don't want that usually. So our, most of the time your vanishing points are not on the canvas. Usually they're very, very far off the canvas and there's only a very small area that's not distorted. I see the waterfall. I think it's going to look cool. Thank you. Right, and there was also a tree here, which I had blocked in. Yeah, it actually ends right here. There we go. You can draw a little bit off the canvas as well. Right, if I turn it all off, now it comes back. Right. But I'm going to keep it on because I still need to see my perspective lines. <laughs> this is the best thing about drawing things that are organic is that you can follow your perspective lines, but they don't have to be entirely exact. They just got to be kind of in the know, you know? So I'm going to adjust a lot of these as well. I'm just keeping it generally in perspective for now. we got a lot of rocks and we got a lot of there's a water's edge right there 
Could you please suggest me another app other than Medibang? Um, well, I don't use any apps. Um, well, I guess I guess it does. It is an app. Um, I just call them like software. Um, my personal drawing software, the one that I actually use all the time, is Photoshop CC. Um, I don't use Medibang very often actually. Um, I use it mostly to just to teach. Um, the other software that I use is Clip Studio Paint. Clip Studio Paint is fantastic for artists, so I highly suggest that one if you're on a budget. Um, but both of those are paid. So I, like for me, Medibang is the only free program that I use. Um, so Clip Studio, you have to pay once. Photoshop is a yearly subscription. Um, I know that some people at the studio like Krita. Personally, I don't like Krita just because it's not very transferable. Um... But if you like Krita, that's great. It's just I don't really like the UI that much because it's not similar to any of the other programs that I use. It's very, very different. Um, but yeah. My laptop would die if you'd, if you'd make the canvas that big. If the resolution of the frame is good enough to be an artwork and not just the thumbnail. Yeah, so this entire sheet is 10,000 by 15,000 pixels. So this down here should be about 5,000 by something pixels. And yes, Krita is free. It's just Krita does not translate very well to more industry um, level programs. Um, Photoshop and Clip Studio are extremely similar. So their shortcuts are very, very much the same. Um, I know that a lot of Krita users have trouble switching over to different programs. Save for me, no money. Um, but yeah, a lot of Krita users have trouble switching over to different programs because of how like non-transferable they tend to be. Because their UI is very, very different. And, like, overall, that's fine. It's just that it, that'll end up causing problems later down the line. A PC would die. <laughs> Sad. I just got a new PC. So, like, my PC is, like, pretty powerful at the point, at the moment. If you know anything about computers, my brother says that it's really, really good. He's the one who's, um suggested it to me. I don't know any of the other specs other than it has like a Ryzen 2070, 2070 Super. Apparently that's a really good graphics card. I don't know much about computers. <laughs> God, I have to learn Photoshop. I'm just a critic guy. Yeah, you don't have to learn Photoshop. Photoshop is just what people call industry standard. Um, like if you're going into like a big company, most companies use like Photoshop as their tool. But you don't have to. Like, if you're just kind of working on your own, it's just that people like to learn multiple programs, like, because, um, you know, if you work in a studio, sometimes studios use very specific programs. Which pen is good to draw? You mean, like, tablet? Same as because of you. You use Ibis Paint, Medibang, that's all not a go. I got one, so I'll try to use that. Cool. I don't know much about Ibis. I know, like, I, I have a lot of people who use Ibis, but I've never used it before. Like, I know quite a few people who use Ibis. I've never tried it out personally. I might, just so I kind of know how the UI goes. Because I have a lot of students that use Ibis. There we go. See? Now all that mess of lines is gone. Now it feels more like a waterfall. <laughs> Right? I, I told you I promised you I knew what I was doing. Um, but now we can start to add in no Medibank. Yeah, I quite like Medibank. Medibank is, compared to the paid programs that I use, Medibank is quite similar to them, and that's why I like it. Um, it is very rudimentary, though. I will say that. Like, it does have a lot of things that it could improve on. Um, but in terms of what it is, it's quite good. And it's easily transferable into the extremely advanced um programs for me the tablet that i use is a cintiq pro uh, or cintiq 13 hd um so it's an older kind of art tablet um not not one of the newer cintiqs this one's a bit of an older model but still works like a charm right so that's gonna be my first sketch pass <laughs> Right, so I'm going to add in some extra stuff now. Right, we went from <laughs> this huge mess of lines. Right, now I can get rid of it. And we have our actual, our actual waterfall now. 
So let's move on to a second, our fourth sketch pass, I suppose. Four. All right, so here's my final. This will be my more finalized sketch pass. What? Yeah, like, if I'm being honest, um, when I was first told that I had to draw on Medibank, I'm very particular about what programs I'm use, I use. Finally, download with Krita, and I'm going to use that. You can try. Yeah, Krita's very, very different compared to Medibank. Um, it's like, you can use Krita if you'd like. It's just, it's, I know that Krita is just a little bit funky around the corners. It's, a lot of its controls are a little bit different. Um, it can get really weird. But that's just because I'm impatient. <laughs> you tried painting with Coral Paint Shop, but I'm too dumb for it. My PC doesn't like it, so we'll back to Krita, I guess. Yeah, Krita, I know, though, doesn't use take up a lot of space. That I know. Krita doesn't take a lot of processing power. I wonder what shortcuts they had to use. Because Photoshop takes up, like, a ton of processing power. All Adobe products tape up a lot of processing power. Um, but yeah, I'm very I'm very particular about what programs I use. <laughs> what programs I use, what materials I use. I'm kind of a snob when it comes to that stuff. Um, like, I'm willing to try stuff, but if I don't like it, then I'll, like, denounce it for as long as I live. <laughs> it's just, like, kind of a bad trait about me. But, you know, when I was told that I... He's like, hey, Jesse, you should work in Medibank because it's like a free program and like we should use it for the studio. And I was like, all right. right? <laughs> I wasn't like, I wasn't super happy. But like, honestly, it's it's pretty good. Like, I like this this program. It's not too bad um, compared to like the other programs I use. Like, it's got very, si very similar functions. It opens up Photoshop files. That's why I save everything as a PSD. So then I can open up in Photoshop later and edit it. But of course, there are some things that are a little more rudimentary in terms of like just the the UI functions, the user interface and whatnot. My files get huge, like 60 layers of credit file. That's, my files are huge for some reason. Yeah. Use Medibang on my mobile devices and Clip Studio Paint on my laptop. I like them because you can save your drawings to cloud. For tablet, I use the pen display VK 1200. Got it for 240 bucks. Yep, so a VK. That's... um. God. Veek is part of uh, XP Pen, I believe. You hate the thing the most when you mistakenly draw on the wrong layer. The way that you avoid that is by changing your layer opacity and also by locking the layers when you're done with them. Right? So if I need this layer, right? If I still need this layer, I'm not going to lock it, but I'll always turn down the opacity because depending on the color I'm using, if I draw in here, it'll look lighter, right? And then I go, oh, that's the wrong layer. Let me move to the next one. Right? So that's kind of a way you can not mix up your, your lines with your sketch. If it's color, I can't help you. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, it's, that's, that's an easy way to kind of avoid it. Because you're using Clip Studio as well, there's a really easy way to get rid of your sketch if you accidentally do do it on the same layer. Um, I believe if you use the magic wand, you should have a checkbox somewhere that says contiguous. If you, unche if you uncheck that and then click somewhere where your sketch is, turn off the tolerance as well. Yeah, um, if you uncheck that contiguous box and then click your s one part of your sketch, you should be able to select the entire sketch, you backspace and it's gone. That's another really easy way. Um, if not, then that might just be a Photoshop thing. I'm sorry. Um, but Clip is very, very similar to Photoshop, which is why I'm saying you might have it. Um, Photoshop is more photo editing oriented. So it has a lot of very photo edity shortcuts. If it doesn't have that, I'm sorry. Um, but hopefully it does. But that's how I always got rid of my sketches, just in case if I mess them up. One thing you'll notice me do a lot is constantly turn off layers to check them. Always do that, especially if you're working on a sketch layer and you're going onto something just slightly more clean. Always turn off your layers to check how you're doing. 
right? Because you might go super, super far in and then you're like, oh, that doesn't look great, right? So you're going to have to constantly turn off different layers to check and see if it looks good without them as well. And if it doesn't, you're going to have to go back and edit it. Right? It's a little bit easier than like doing the entire thing and then you turn off the sketch layer and then you're like, oh, that doesn't look great. <laughs> and then you just wasted all that time for nothing. Right? Constantly be checking your work. Constantly, constantly, constantly. This is shit, actually. Work like this. If the line art kills the sketch, yeah. If you actually want to know the slight psychology behind this, I like to tell my students this a lot. Um, when you are doing your sketch, the thing with the sketch is that you're not being very exact. So it's kind of like, if you draw a circle, right? If you try to draw a circle just kind of in one go, right? You'll notice all your little mistakes. But if you sketch it out, right? It feels a lot more exact because your brain approximates the perfect area, right? And you're you're like, oh yeah, now that looks that looks so clean, right? Because your your brain is approximating for where the exact section would be. But because you have less of that when it comes to drawing just a singular line, right? With your line work, you get a lot more annoyed. <laughs> So the way that some people avoid that is just, you know, cleaning up their sketch a ton so then it looks so similar to their uh, to their lines. But I, I don't do that. I try to... I, I like clean sketches, but I try not to spend forever on them or else, you know, it's going to, like, waste time. Especially with hands. Uh, yeah. I have a love for drawing hands, I'm sorry. I can't be in the boat and that's like, I hate hands because I've started to love drawing hands. I just love to draw things that make me angry. It's like, other than cars, cars are the only thing that I will, I think I'll forever hate drawing. Um, but everything difficult, most things that are difficult, I tend to love to draw because they give me a challenge. I love me a good challenge. smooth out this edge so it feels more like it's in the water Right, so there's my rocks, big rocks, but I'm going to pause here for a second to talk a little bit about our studio, right? So if you did not know, right, we are not only a YouTube channel, but we are also an art studio and an art school, right? So we have multiple lovely teachers in this little art school of ours. I am one of them. <laughs> I am one of the art instructors here at Wing Canvas. If you'd like to check out any of the classes that we offer, I am one of the teachers who teaches um, Alyssa behind the Wing Canvas channel is also one of the instructors, and lovely Faye, who may or may not still be in here, is also one of the instructors, so if you'd like to check out any of the classes that we offer, feel free to do so. Um, in this file that you see in front of you, this little file with the background that I am starting, plus this one with all of my... Um, perspective stuff that will be available on our discord for you to download as a jpeg it's all yours you can keep it save it do whatever you want with it um, just don't repost it it's all yours um, but unfortunately this will be exactly how you see it as a jpeg but this one will only be the final file so when i finish all my lines you'll only be able to see that not any of my perspective lines but if you would like to see all my perspective lines you are going to have to join our patreon which is where you can get access to all of my working files they are saved as psds which can be opened by most digital art softwares so if you would like access to all of those be sure to join there and we also have limited time spots for our um classes which are which are uh spot 
oh my god there are spots that have discounts on our classes um so but they are in limited amounts if you would like to take advantage of those feel free to do so and be sure to do so before they are gone all right let's go back to this then continuing to clean up i couldn't draw because i was stressed out because of an exam yeah it is finals week for college kids um my best friend is a little bit stressed too i know all my Past college friends are also very stressed <laughs> as well. Even though we are not in the same program anymore, I am with them in spirit. Oh, and of course, if you ever need to go back and re-watch this stream, this stream will be up on our YouTube channel in full for you to always come back to. So if you ever needed to, if you ever, if you accidentally skip the step or if you don't know what's happening, you can always look back on it and check out what's happening. You don't have money or else I would. That's fine. We do have one-time donations as well, if you would ever like to do that, but no pressure. Especially if you find discrepancies, edit them without the other sketch layer on, so then you can fix it. with fresher eyes. I don't think I'm great at drawing rocks. Like, I find that, like, I'm very, like, kind of all over the place when it comes to drawing rocks. I'll have students ask me, Jesse, how do you draw rocks? And, like, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to tell it to you, man. <laughs> draw some shapes and hard edges until they look kind of like uh, rocky things. That's the best way I can describe it. Uh Hey, yeah. Hello, Coco Creates. Welcome in. Welcome to the stream. We all kind of, we already kind of went over three-point perspective, but now we're just kind of chilling and watching me draw this waterfall. The thing with the organic stuff in perspective is that like you gotta follow the perspective but also you need to make sure it still feels very organic all right so like trees and waterfalls and rocks and whatever but you gotta make sure that it still feels like a tree and a rock and a, and a waterfall and whatever but you have to do it in perspective so you have to kind of find that balance between you know what's too much in perspective and what isn't in perspective enough Right? With something like a cityscape, it becomes very, that was one of the options in the poll as well, I believe. Um, with something like a cityscape, it has to be very, very obvious where the perspective is coming from because they're all like basically cubes, right? They're man-made stuff. So it'll end up looking very, very much like very harsh perspective, right? But something more natural like this, you know, it won't be super, super harsh because, you know, nature doesn't really make straight edges, right? Nature makes interesting, like kind of non, what's it called? non-geometric shapes within it, right? You notice how I've stayed zoomed out this entire time. I haven't zoomed in once. 
I've only zoomed into the entire canvas itself. <laughs> if I zoomed out completely, I'd be all the way out here, and I can't see any of that. Um, you notice I've only stayed zoomed out from my canvas the entire time, right? That's pretty much what you want to do when you're sketching, right? Don't zoom in while you're sketching anything, because then, you know, you'll get focused too much on certain details, and then that will be the death of you, basically, right? Because then you start to kind of lose focus. And once you zoom back out, it might look a little bit wonky, right? You may have done something completely wrong, and then now you can't fix it. Oh, that is a cliff face. LOL. This is part of the rocks. So is this. So let's sharpen that a little bit. Now it's a tangent, so let's not do that. Right? I've also tried to make it so that I filled in my entire canvas, right? I haven't just drawn it in one single section. It's very, very centered, though. If I had to change one thing about this entire piece, it'd be that the if the waterfall was a little bit less centered. I think I would want to... I'm already critiquing myself. I haven't even finished. I would have made the waterfall... If I had, like... If I had thought a little bit more. I think I would have made the waterfall a little closer to here instead. Because then that would have followed the rule of thirds. But we'll get into that next week when we get into composition. So we're not talking about that just yet. But now that I have finished the sketch itself, right, we've done about four sketch passes. Now I can get into the lining, finally. So we can get into properly cleaning up this entire background. Let me save as well. It's a good idea because I haven't saved once. <laughs> there we go. Stream. Stream 11-2. Oh yeah, it's chugging. <laughs> it does not like how large this file is. I'm going to keep my correction off for this one as well, just to keep it nice and natural looking. I gotta go sleep. All right, bye. Thanks for popping in. This isn't the finished line art. No, it's still the sketch. <laughs> There's still lots of things I gotta correct. We got an hour left to stream. It isn't clean enough yet for my liking. I don't think it will be by the end either, but <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I like my precision, so if I'm doing line art or anything, okay, I, I didn't turn it on my, my correction. <laughs> Picks up far too much of my handshake. So now I'm being far more careful. With how I line my stuff, right? Again, constantly turning off my sketch layer to check if I like what I'm doing or not. Yeah, one thing I do like a lot about Medibank is how sharp its pen tool is. Very big fan of sharp pens. With or without correction. Well, I'm turning on correction right now. Just for this waterfall bit. Once I get to the rocks, I'm going to turn it off 100%. But there's a lot of straight lines when it comes to drawing this waterfall. So I gotta... 
I gotta keep it on just for now. Sorry, if I ever go silent for periods of time, it means I'm concentrating, kind of. It's good. It's fine to use correction, right? If you're using, you know, digital programs, it has, they have, like, correction or smoothing or stabilization or whatever it's called on your program, right? They have those for a reason, right? They're functions and they're there for you to use them, right? So it's totally fine to use them, but I always kind of say, you know, don't rely on them. I'm able to line without them. It's just it's going to take me longer. Depending on what I'm doing, obviously. But, like... You know, depending on what you're lining... Or you shouldn't have like a dependency on your correction. You can, if you can work with it, you can work without it. All right, gotta go to work now. I'll check back later. All right, thanks for joining in. The stream's gonna be going on for another forty-four minutes, so we don't have too too much time left. All right, am I done with the water bits? No, I still have some other stuff. <laughs> turn it on after a few minutes I get frustrated how slow it is and I turn it off again. I think it's time for a new PC, man. <laughs> what do you have? Like, is it just, like, old? Or is it, like... My old laptop was five years old, so she was running real slow, so I'm glad I got a new PC. But I think it's time for a new one, man. <laughs> it keeps, like, frustrating you. Okay, now it's time to do the rocks. And I've turned my correction back off so I can do rocks because rocks are meant to be a little bit more rough. Utilize your handshake to draw rougher edges. You are gifted with shaky hands. Use them to your advantage. It's the same with drawing lightning. If you ever wanted to draw realistic lightning, turn off your correction and use your non-dominant hand. That's how you draw lightning. <laughs> and try to draw a straight line. No correction. No stabilization. Twenty thirteen. It's a Dell business edition. It's not bad really. I'm an impatient person, so the line running after the cursor is frustrating to watch. Gotcha. Yeah. I have an HP Omen, like the PC. And I like it because it looks like a giant monolith. So it feels very on brand for me. <laughs> I'm taking it nice and slow in some areas because I'm realizing that I got a lot of time left, so I'm gonna
take it nice and easy. I'm also going to do a lot of final touches, I suppose. Yeah, I'm going to need to. Okay. <sighs> Sorry, I didn't stretch for a second. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to do some edits. Because... As of right now, there are some lines that need to be cleaned up a little bit more. Just to make them a little bit uh, more obvious. lost in the zone a little bit. <laughs> the trees are really fun because you have like there's a lot of patterns that trees make. Especially with the bark, you know. And I'm really trying to use line weighting to my advantage, right? I'm trying to like make the the extra detailed bits very, very thin. My less detailed bits know a little bit more thick right the silhouettes are very important so I need to make the lines for those quite thick right but the parts of the detail try to make very very thin And now I'm starting to also zoom in some more. Because now I have a lot more details that I want to focus on right now that I've gotten to my line work. Before with the sketch, I could just kind of ignore a lot of it. And now I can no longer do that. I, I forgot the leaves. <laughs> mm, yes. This tree, I have forgotten its leaves. And this time I'm trying not to be too particular about my leaves because if I am, then, you know, it starts to get, like, a little bit too precarious. I don't want to... 
have to deal with that, but that's also very, very exact. So it's feelings a little, feels a little bit less organic. So it's time to take a really big step back. Do I prefer using the G pen for your liner? Generally, no. Usually, I tend to use the the pen for Medibang because Medibang's pen is super super sharp. Um, but this time around, I'm kind of feeling something a little rougher because it's natural, right? It's a natural kind of scene, right? There's a waterfall in a forest, so it makes a little more sense to have something just a smidge rougher. Though because of how large the canvas is, it doesn't really look that rough, I suppose. Um, that's my own fault, I guess. But yeah, I could have turned up the ooze. I have my ooze very, very low. Oh, well, we're part of the, we're part most way through the line work anyway. I'm gonna have to thicken this up to really differentiate between the tree and the rocks. Because right now they're kind of melding together. And I don't want that. You know what I want to do? I kind of want to watch another Ghibli movie. Man. <laughs> we'll watch one at night. Yeah, I'm going to have to edit that waterfall as well because it's starting to meld into the rocks. And I can't deal with that either. I can't deal with that either. Part of me has always wanted to write a story, kind of like um, Miyazaki wrote one of his, right? It's like that whimsical, it's like just so freeing, so like freeform whimsy, but like I don't have the brain for whimsy. <laughs> I just don't. I have a brain that's more set for um, drama and fantasy. Drama with fantasy? Sorry. That tends to be what I thrive on writing, or what I'm best at writing. I, w I do wish I was better at whimsy. It's just so good. I love whimsical stuff. I'm not as care. I'm not carefree enough though. <laughs> just because a lot of Ghibli's ideas are like so genius. It's like you you watch them back and it's like whoa. It's like, look at how gorgeous it all is. That's why I think I, I think I said it last stream. Like I had fail safes when it comes to music. Um, like if I listen to certain music, then like it, it instantly gives me inspiration. Howl's Moving Castle's theme is one of them because Howl's Moving Castle is also like one of my fail safe movies. If I watch certain things, it'll instantly give me inspiration too. Any Ghibli movie has the ability to give me instant inspiration for hours. It's my superpower. If I ever need to do, like, very... If I need to be creative very quickly, I'll watch a Ghibli movie. And then I'll be good. I'll be set for the rest of the night. <laughs> so while I had to do my portfolio, I watched maybe, like, seven Ghibli movies. <laughs> like, in a week. And some of them I watched back-to-back. -back. I remember I watched... Um, I watched Ponyo, and then I watched The Secret World of Arietti, back to back. Both of those movies are so, so good. Like, Ponyo has a special place in my heart. It was my very first Ghibli. Arietti's pretty good, too, and I watched it back when I was in fifth grade. But, man. Sorry, this speaking of rant, a ramble about how much I love Ghibli, I <laughs> if you've never seen a Ghibli movie, please do. Like, it's, like, the best thing ever. So right now I'm kind of just cleaning up, picking and choosing what areas I want to point out and which ones I don't. 
This area feels very empty, so I'm going to add something in here, even though it's not in my sketch. So I'm going to freehand a bit of something here. Right, just a little bit of a crack there. And it feels a little more filled in now, over here too. I think I could use a couple of somethings. Usually less is more. I'm realizing now that I have a lot of those crack shapes and I should probably change that. Same triangle over and over. How do I get such clean line art? Practice and pain. <laughs> I love line art. I've been doing line art for like my whole life. It's like if I 90% like a lot of my friends like to practice color. I prefer to practice line art. So like traditionally, like I would do a lot of traditional line art um, as well. So it's kind of like, you know, practicing, getting used to it, growing to have a steady hand, you know? You see my correction? Yeah. I mean, I had my correction on for the waterfall. Um, But growing to have that steady hand is super, super important when it comes to line art. But it does depend on what you're drawing as well, right? Like, I'm trying not to have very steady lines. I'm crack. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel, one of our other lovely YouTube content creators. Voice of the art history videos. But yeah, that's my default crack. If it's a triangle. <laughs> Triangles on top of extra squares. Right. Things feel a lot more precise even when they're not. I think that's my, my secret. You know. It feels very repeated though. I kind of want to change some of them. But yes, welcome to both of you. Glad to have you in stream. Yeah, you kind of just got to practice over and over. I still don't think I'm great at rocks. Like, I could probably do better. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll have, like, a whole rock drawing day. I just practice rocks all day. <laughs> Technically, these rocks should be a lot smoother because they're crashing up against waterfalls. I'm realizing now. Them being this rocky doesn't make sense. <sighs> Whatever. <laughs> These are the things you think about when you're in design. It's like, yeah, them being this rocky doesn't make sense. They would normally be smoother if it's like on the side of a waterfall. Because over time, the water would have worn away at the rocks. Right? If you've ever been to the ocean, like at a beach, you ever notice how all the beach pebbles are very, very smooth? It's because the water has been wearing away at them. You got to double check with stuff like that. I had an assignment back in like first year college where we had to um, we had to clean up these backgrounds, right? We were given a, an option of like five different backgrounds, and the one that I chose was a truck in the middle of the countryside, right? And one thing that I noticed about that background was that the the countryside it had like electrical poles, right? It had like telephone poles. But the telephone pole was the same type of telephone pole that you'll see in a city, which doesn't make sense for the countryside. So you'd have to change it to something more rudimentary, right? That's what a cleanup artist does, by the way. If somebody draws a background and you're a cleanup artist, what a cleanup artist does is it takes the background that that person drew and fixes it. <laughs> Whether it's cleaning up the perspective or making the lines cleaner or whatever, right? There's a lot of things that somebody can do. In a perspective and you really have to think when it comes to design unfortunately you got to think while you draw so 
you know, like every little aspect of a scene has to pertain to where you are, right? One other fun little detail, um, if you've ever watched Stranger Things, there's like, you know, the um, Will's family, right? It could be a new waterfall, very true. If it isn't like, <laughs> if it isn't old, yeah. We'll say that it's new. It was just, uh, it was just born. But hello, welcome in, Gabriel. Glad you, glad you're in. Yeah, let's say let's say that uh, this just broke. Yeah, yeah, this waterfall's new, completely new. That's why the rocks are still rocky. There we go. <laughs> if it's not super super intense. Um, but yeah, one little fun detail from Stranger Things um, that I really liked was like Will's family, right? They're a little less wealthy. Um, so they had like a, an older car. My dad was like, that car was from like five years ago. And I'm like, well, they're not a wealthy family. So it wouldn't make sense to have for them to have the newest label. label or, yeah, the newest model. <laughs> and he was like, oh, you're right. Right? Little things. Little things you got to think about. But then, of course, you could always excuse it away, kind of like, well, Gary, Gabriel just gave me an out. <laughs> kind of like the excuse that all writers hate. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but it's magic. So why does it have to make any sense? <laughs> it's magic. They're aliens. It's a different world. It's a dystopian future. Right? Those are the excuses that writers hate, but they work. The foolproof ones. The cop-outs. But it works. <laughs> Why is that floating there? Magic. Yeah. How am I going to draw this rock now? Because I just left it open. Well, I can kind of mimic that a little bit. that rougher that's too clean got to keep that harmony keep that harmony up there that's a principle of design yeah now I have a craving to watch a Ghibli movie I don't know if I should watch a new one or one that I've already seen though because part of me wants to watch Spirited Away again but I'm always like I feel exposed as a writer <laughs> You and me both. <laughs> as a comic artist, I also feel exposed. As my my fantasy drama is called out. <laughs> All right, rocks. <laughs> Oh, it's taken a while to to load there to save. Good grief. All right. There we go. Yeah, especially with really large files, sometimes it's like, uh, got to drag along. <laughs> uh, writers. They're such a strange bunch, but I love writing. I've been writing ever since I was a kid, like comics and just physically typing when I was younger I wrote a 150 page story it took me from like fourth grade to sixth grade <laughs> just writing a whole story out in my free time I'd go on my old little Acer laptop just my fun time like just when I do stuff for fun I just open up my little Acer laptop type up a couple chapters of the story and go okay that's it for me today and then I'd go back to drawing <laughs> Uh, simpler times, dude. I miss that. Okay, actually, I'm going to zoom out for these because if I zoom too far in, then I'm going to get upset. Plus, I don't want to focus too hard on the leaves. I 
How do you get better at drawing without reference? Draw with reference. <laughs> Draw with reference over and over and over. Um, because, you know, if you kind of sit there and draw... Draw with references. Yeah, so you draw with references first. Um, and over time, you kind of start to learn to work with that. I always say, because when you draw without a reference and you've memorized it, um, that's called... it. That means that it's been added to your visual library, right? I always say that your visual library only gets filled up if you not only can draw it from memory, but you also understand what you're doing, right? Like if you draw human anatomy, I, even though I've been doing, I can teach anatomy, I can do whatever, I still use references for anatomy all the time. And that's because like sometimes, you know, there's different body types that I don't completely understand, right? Or there's a pose that I don't completely understand. So I have to look up a reference, right? The way that you kind of learn to work without references is use more and more and more references. Don't only look at the image, read about it too try to figure out what, how other people do it. Um, sometimes you can look up, I prefer image tutorials over video tutorials. So I have a lot of images saved for reference. Um, you know, like with animals, right? I, I understand kind of how their feet work or how like their legs work or stuff like that, right? I only kind of want grass here. Um, right? So it's kind of like just work more and more without the reference as time goes on. I'm working without reference for the sake of time right now. <laughs> um, I would, if I was to draw like a background like this for like a client or if I was to do it for like, um, like a school project or a, like a comic panel or something, I would be using reference right now. Like I'd be looking up waterfalls. I'd be looking up how rocks would work. I would have not drawn them so rocky and would have made them smooth. <laughs> um... Right? But alas, I didn't do that. But, you know, same kind of deal. So you gotta work with reference for long enough to work without it. A good way I find to work with reference, so there's a difference between working with a reference and studying. Working with a reference means that you're kind of learning to understand what it is that you're drawing. Right? Using multiple references and then also kind of, you know, changing aspects of what you see about your reference, right? If I'm drawing something with a reference, I'm drawing it from a different angle or I'm adding on my own kind of spin to it, right? A reference is there to inspire. It's not, or to inspire, to help you with accuracy. It's not really meant to copy, right? Unless if you're studying. Studying is a little bit different because if you're studying something, then you probably are going to be like directly copying for the sake of learning, right? But if you're working with a reference that's meant to just inspire you, right? You shouldn't really be copying it. You should instead just be like, you should be working towards understanding what it is that you're drawing. But studying is also a really good way to learn how to draw, right? I love doing master studies. Um, I wish I could do more. <laughs> um, I really, really want to do more. Um, kind of off topic, I guess, but like for my own personal webcomic, what I really, really want to do is make my chapter covers master studies for public domain um, paintings that relate to the chapter that's going to happen. Right, so I really, really want to do more master studies, so I'm going to make them my chapter covers, right? Like actually digitally paint um, master studies. And because it's public domain, right, I have the... Like, I'm free to do it because it's so, so old, right? There wasn't really copyright on paintings back from the 1300s. So, I mean, I always thought that drawing comics is a helpful thing because you get variety. You can focus on different criteria. That's for a lot of kind of mixed media style art forms. My favorite types of artists are doll artists. For some reason, doll artists just know everything, right? And they know anatomy, they know design, they know sewing, they know palettes, they know the color theory. It's like, they know how to sculpt. They know how to do concept art. They know everything, every aspect of art, I find. Or, like, because doll artists are, like, the straight, like, the most, the, like, three-dimensional, like, other than, like, modelers, obviously, like, 3D modelers. But, like, doll artists are, like, a three-dimensional concept artist. Right, and, like, they're, they're. They're fashion designers, writers, concept artists, and, like, 
ev- they like everything rolled into one. Sculptors, painters. Because usually they have to work with a lot of mixed media. And like, so they work with like tons of different mediums as well, right? Some doll artists are so crafty, right? Because sometimes they want to make, because they need to make their, same with cosplayers actually, right? Because they need to work with like materials that make their dolls light. They also need to work with as little materials as possible, right? To keep it light. Um, A lot of the times they have to work with alternatives because doll making is very expensive. But sometimes you want to work with like, more inexpensive tools right right they use a lot of materials that are really usually better for the environment um scrap pieces of fabric they work with um you know dolls that have been like um well loved previously so they buy used a lot of the time right doll artists know like everything i have nothing but respect for doll artists right doll makers they're they're so, so good. I love getting inspiration from doll artists. Some of my own personal, like, illustrative techniques are from doll artists. It's, they're so good. <laughs> it's just, there's just so much to do. Comic artists, you get that writing factor in. You have to learn how to write. You have to learn how to do backgrounds. You have to learn how to um, do concept art. Line, color, everything. So that's that's also another kind of form of, like, you know, you gotta learn everything. <laughs> um, you're your own writer and editor, and <laughs> especially if you're indie. Um, if you're in a team, then you have more allocated. Like, you're gonna be the colorist, you're the, the background artist, you're the, the person who puts in the text, right? Stuff like that. Um, if you're indie, if you're on your own, then you're on your own, buddy. Like, not every comic artist has an editor. Not every comic artist has, like, a colorist or anything like that, right? Most of the time, it's just them on their own, right? (laughs) I kind of like the way I did this one. I'm going to change this other tree, too. Yeah, you definitely have to have that kind of versatility when it comes to working with different art forms, right? Usually it's good to not limit yourself to just kind of being one type of artist, right? Same with art styles. You know, lots of people kind of get hung up on learning art styles. Learn a variety. Who says you can't have versatility? Versatility is a gift. If you have the ability to switch between styles at will, do you know how useful that is? Especially if you want to work in like a studio. A studio, like if you're going to be an animator, you have to know how to switch styles like like super easily. Right, because every most like animation studios and game studios, all the artists have to learn to draw in somebody else's art style. Right, so that becomes very, very important. Okay, so I've finished the majority. Now it's just going to be me fixing up everything. Right, so here's one tip that I kind of tell everyone. Right, if you, I've been told a lot. Thanks, I've been drawing for reference most of my life, but sometimes I have trouble putting the references away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no problem with just using tons of references, right? I find that, you know, the more references, the better, just because then, you know, let's, like, you know, <laughs> kind of, I guess if you use more references, it's more accurate, right? I haven't been using references my whole life. I found that as I've gotten older, I've started to use more references, but when I was younger, I never used any. Now it's like I use them all the time. Um... But yeah, now I'm just going to be, you know, we got about 12 minutes till 6. Um, now I'm just going to be cleaning up everything. Because it may look kind of clean, but like, you know, there's a lot of areas I want to fix. Um, if you look at anything and you squint, right? If things start to meld, like any of your art pieces, if you look at it and then squint, right? That's going to make it kind of blurry. If you notice that any part of it starts to meld together, that's when you know you have to fix it, right? Especially when it comes to color. So I know I want to make the waterfall protrude out a little bit more. So I'm going to beef up this lines here but especially if you start to notice that certain areas start to feel like they're kind of blending in together don't really feel like they're popping out quite as much you gotta fix that so I gotta make my waterfall a little bit more obvious because the water portion kind of blends in with everything and that doesn't feel right So I've got to make it pop a little bit more. Oh, 
another good way is just to zoom all the way out. <laughs> zoom all the way out, and you'll be able to see kind of the the edges you made for yourself. I usually only use references for trees because I can never figure out the branches. The best thing about tree branches is that they're completely random. <laughs> so, like, you can use tons of references for, for trees. No two of them will be exactly the same. I don't really have any tips for drawing trees. My trees have become kind of muscle memory. <laughs> I don't really... Um, but... Yeah, trees! Oh my god, I just need my desk. Fantastic. If I decided to add clouds at this stage, should I add them using the perspective guides? Yes. So the thing with clouds, though, is that clouds are two dimensional, especially if it's like from below. Right. If you wanted to kind of have that three dimensional aspect, usually you wouldn't do that. So more likely than not, what you would do um, with your vanishing points, what you would most likely do is actually just use this bottom portion. Right. You would only use these two vanishing points and add like, you know, like squares kind of rectangles kind of going across right what you can actually do an easy way to do clouds right is if you do clouds in perspective you could have like two vanishing points in your thing you would draw your your rectangle and then you would add the shape within it it's more likely than not clouds are going to be more like on the bottom kind of area of course, it depends on which way you want them to be going. Right, because like it depends on which way like the horizon goes or where the the wind is blowing or whatever, right? Because clouds always correspond with whichever way the wind is blowing. So you gotta decide that. No, delete. There we go. But yeah, you could definitely add in clouds at this stage. I don't have any clouds because the, the sky is kind of covered up but <laughs> if you wanted to add clouds you could and yeah you should definitely use the perspective guides like is it necessary technically no but it'll look a lot nicer if you use the perspective guides like the perspective vanishing points and whatever so is it necessary no but will it help yes <laughs> Cool, thanks. No worries. Alright, there's about seven minutes left till six, so I don't have too too much left to do. Oh, I just, I realized I missed two spots. Fantastic. I'll fill those in after. Okay. Now I have to get a little bit more precise with these leaves. You notice how I've kind of zoomed in here, and a lot of the lines now feel a lot less exact. That's because I wasn't worrying about them being completely exact all the time. But now that I'm close in, now it's irking me, and I'm like, I gotta fix it. But you shouldn't. <laughs> so just ignore it. Move past it. You're only thickening up the lines a little bit. That's all you're doing. Because it's very rare that people will really zoom in on your work, right? 90% of the time you'll be working, like, you'll work on your artwork, and people will stare at it for two seconds, then go, oh yeah, great, and then just move on. Kind of sucks, but it's the reality. Right. <laughs> right, unless if you got like some real like artist people who are like, oh yes, I will zoom in on this completely. And then they'll just bash your head in for <laughs> making this line wrong. I really like this, but like I noticed how this little tick here just doesn't feel quite exact. Adjudicators are like that, unfortunately. Um, but you know, like, just 99% of the time, if you're working and you're just, like, posting it on social media or something, good enough is better than perfect. It's kind of the motto of a lot of designers, good enough is better than perfect. You know, sometimes you just gotta work as best you can. It's like, no one's really gonna notice a tiny little tick is off, right? If it's just like an audience. Wahoo! Hello, Karina. Welcome in. Oh, 
Ooh, I think Animal Crossing's 2.0 update is coming soon. I, it's either tomorrow or today or some other day. Really close. And I am excited. <laughs> I want that 2.0 update, man. Lightning speed. Lightning speed. I gotta be fast. Sonic speed. I'm not gonna do the voice. I usually like to imitate Sonic's voice, but I'm not. I'm not feeling it. <laughs> Sonic speed. Um. But yes, welcome in to whoever has first popped up. One tip that I was given by my professor, my pre-production professor, um, was that, you know, if you add in too much detail, then it suddenly feels like there's no detail at all. Which is very true, right? You need to have resting spots with a lot of designs, right? You gotta have areas where there feels like there, where there's like no real extreme detail, because then, you know, if you have too much detail, then everything starts to get muddy and it feels like they're all kind of melding together, right? And the one way to kind of avoid that, right, is to just make some lines a little bit thicker. To really eliminate it. Still slightly bothering me. This area I can help me out in. Another tree or two. Any tips for coloring? Lots! So color theory, a really good way to learn to color. <laughs> um, pay attention to your palettes, right? Um, a lot of the times, you know, a, a palette is really just choosing three colors and then kind of working off their hues and blending them together and whatnot, right? Um, Try to not use too many neons if you're going for bright stuff. I don't think I need to. No, I don't. Try not to use too many neons. Generally, your colors will want to kind of be in this range in the center. Never too much to the extremes, right? Unless you kind of are going for that. But more often than not, you'll want to be more in the center of your color picker, right? Um, I think we have a coloring stream coming up. We have got a blending stream coming up. So like shading and whatnot. And we have a line art stream before that. So I'll be talking about lines as well. Um, but yeah. Use references for look up palettes if you're really kind of stuck. Like color palettes if you're really stuck. One thing that's really, really good is, like, if you just kind of, um, oh, actually, does this program have that filter? Mosaic, yes, it does. So if you kind of take an image that you really like, right, and then put on the mosaic filter on top of it, or, like, the pixelation, um, filter, whatever, it'll turn all the colors into easy-to-eyedrop pick colors. <laughs> Easy-to-pick-up colors with your eyedropper, right? That's a great way to make palettes. Some people actually like to make take the text tool and then zoom in super, super close on the pixels and find all the colors that are in there. Easy easy um, palettes as well. I'm trying to point out. I'm trying to see if there's anything that I need to fix because there's some stuff that is bothering me. This is kind of bothering me down here. But yeah, there's lots of ways to color. Color is so, like, there's so many rules associated with it, but also people like to break those rules a lot. We have a video on color, if you're not sick of hearing my voice, where I talk a bit about color theory. It's a bit frantic, though. So if you want to watch it, you can. Um, how is this free? What do you mean, how is this free? <laughs> Ugh. You know what? 
yeah if i work too much on it i'll start to get more frustrated so i can kind of i can see pretty much all the different shapes if i zoom out so i'll just leave it at that okay cool yeah okay that is six o'clock though so thank you everyone for joining in on the stream um if you were not here for the halfway point and don't know too much about our studio, we are not only a YouTube channel, but we are also an art studio. So we also are like a proper art school. So if you would ever like to check out any of the classes that we offer, I am one of the teachers, along with lovely Faye, who is in the chat briefly sometimes, um, and Alyssa, who is behind the Wing Canvas channel currently. Um, so if you would like to check out the classes that we offer, feel free to check out our class our website link in the description below and this file that you see in front of you along with this one that we did initially with all of the different shapes and um, explanations for three-point perspective those will be available as jpegs to download on our social media as such um or not as such sorry um like on our discord which i will be uploading as a jpeg for free which you can download keep it save it it is all yours so feel free to join our discord if you would like access to any of the files that i work on during the stream and if you would like to but unfortunately though this file that you see before you so this one will look exactly the same when i upload it as a jpeg but this file will only be the finished file so you will not get any of my sketch layers and you'll not be able to see any of the vanishing points or anything that i have uploaded as well so if you would like to see any of the any of those be sure to join us on our patreon which you can get access to all of my working files and you can get access to all of the other um perks of our studio such as you know behind the scenes sneak peeks and different you know um discounts on our classes which are in limited um space which there is limited space so be sure to join um before they're all gone but yeah thank you so so much for joining everyone thank you it's very informative and interesting i'm glad um but thank you so much everyone for joining we'll be here next week same time same place um what is next week what's next week's live stream i don't remember um let me check oh composition so we'll just be talking about backgrounds <laughs> we'll be talking about how to set up a background next week um and composition in general but thank you so so much everyone for joining and we'll see you next week bye bye